Hello everyone, it's been a while, hasn't it? You know, life intervened and I was busy on a number of things, but here we are, back to answer a question which I received months and months ago. And it's an important and exciting subject about death on a massive scale. Okay, so months ago, disappointed turtle asked how could today's world look like if the Permian extinction event didn't happen. Okay, lot to unpack here. First of all, I'm sure most of you know, but for posterity, let's go over what the Permian extinction was. When we think about mass extinctions these days, we mostly think about dinosaurs or perhaps the mass extinction we are causing on Earth today. But the closest the Earth ever came to dying out completely, like the absolute death of everything and anything, was during the Permian extinction event around 250 million years ago. And this was a massive and catastrophic death on a scale that hasn't been since, since or before. To put things into perspective, uh, data indicates, and I'm quoting Wikipedia, 83% of all species became extinct. In some sea ecosystems, almost 96%, think about this, of everything died. And it's the only known mass extinction that affected insects. Usually insects sail through pretty uneventfully through mass extinctions. They exist in a different scale of life. So to imagine a world where this event didn't happen, let's look at what was living before the Permian extinction. So imagine you're in the Permian period and you're exploring the land and the seas. The land you would see would be dominated by a lot of waddling, fat lizard slash crocodile slash frog-like creatures. And they would be quite big too. There would be like these couch-sized or even larger or in most cases even smaller. There were a lot of these things and if you saw them today, maybe you would call them lizards or reptiles, but their relationships were much stranger. So let's go over. We had lots of amphibians too, and they weren't like your regular frogs or newts. For example, we had the temnospondyl amphibians. Remember, we call them amphibians now, but this was a very big group actually. And in this group, there were lineages as distinct as marsupials are from placental mammals today. So one of those groups were the temnospondyl amphibians. And usually you know these guys from things like Eriops, the big flat-headed slash crocodile slash frog slash newt-like thing. And, you know, there were a lot of them around, mostly living in swamps and... They were like enormous newts crossed with perhaps crocodiles. I mean, ecologically, they fill the niche that I think crocodiles occupy now, but they were a unique group of large salamander-like flattened things. So that's one. And this is a huge group, by the way. I mean, you got um, things like edopoids, zygosaurus, Dinosauroids, which are like more big tadpole type things. I mean, it's a hugely diverse group, and the group is called Temnospondyls. Go look at them if you want. And how they relate to present day amphibians is somewhat controversial. Let's suffice it to say that experts consider themselves to be distant cousins of the Lysamphibian amphibians that exist today. 
But that's not all there were. That's not all there was to amphibians. We also had leptospondyls, which seem to be more reptilian amphibianoids. Once again, the classification is kind of unclear. And these were actually smaller than the temnospondyls. Remember, the previous clade we discussed, temnospondyls were quite large, you know, they were like one meter, two meters long, in some cases even larger. So they were these big armored newt-like things. But leptospondyls are smaller and more diverse. I mean, you have very interestingly legless and snake-like leptospondyls. They would be like these smooth amphibian eel-like things and extremely cool actually things like adelospondylus it's like looks like this big headed thick snake with the eyes on the tip of the skull or the famous astopods the snakes before snakes remember in this day and age there were no proper snakes or like things like oistocephalus which was once again imagine a smooth snake with an elongated head of a newt or a frog and you get something so you got a whole confusion of these snake like leptospondyls and then you got some of the favorite prehistoric amphibians the diplocolus clade for example the famous extinct amphibian with two big wing like bony prongs growing out of its skull and then you got many other uh, leptospondyl sorry lepospondyl i've been spelling them wrong the whole time along so you got a bunch of other lepospondyl groups such as burrowing forms you know things like quasi amphibian moles and lizard-like things that no one knows where to place so these were really diverse and strange and some were doubtlessly aquatic but others seem more reptile-like and there is arguments whether some of them could have reproduced on land but once again you're looking at a group that are yeah amphibians but not quite amphibians as we know them very strange very strange also you got another small group of maybe maybe amphibians named batracosaurs i mean to sum up there were a lot of amphibians and some of them were quite big and crocodile like in terms of their niche others were smaller more diverse and they were more lungfish to snake to mole and lizard like in terms of their niches and then of course we have proper reptiles we have a shitload to be honest of weird things for example there's a big group called diadectidae the diadectes and relatives and basically these are two to three meter long very thick lizard like things that are not lizards, that they are not even reptiles. They seem to be cousins of every other animal that laid eggs on land. And they were very heavy and stockily built. They had sprawling legs, massive digging forelimbs. And unusually, their skulls were fully bony. They were, at one point, at one point people thought they were related to turtles, but I guess not because now turtles don't seem that archaic but these diadectites they were like imagine a big tick 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 massive stupid lizard that's actually not a lizard but a distant cousin of everything that lays eggs on land and maybe you got an idea these were herbivores obviously they had smallish heads and they just grazed and grazed and just ate things and got fat so that's the way your major terrestrial lineages were evolving and moving on you have also had 
things like paria sores. These are also reptiles with thick bones and no holes in their skull. And remember that most animals have some sort of holes in their skull for the attachment of muscles or to keep the structure light or other reasons. But the two clades I've been discussing, the diadectids and the pereosaurs, no such things. And pereosaurs seem to be more proper reptiles, but once again, a distant cousin of all reptiles that followed after. And they had more erect looking limbs, comically small heads. I mean, no neck to speak of whatsoever. They looked really dumb and funny, but I guess they were successful. There were a lot of forms, you know, and they had armor in some cases. These were like herbivores with a business, you know, they were, they looked silly, but they weren't going extinct anytime soon. Moving on. By the way, I'm just reading these from the sources I have, so I may have mistakes, feel free to correct, and I'm certain I'm leaving out many animals. But let's go, let's go. Closer to mammals. Now you have very interesting things going on in the Permian period. You see, this was an age where mammals actually seemed to dominate the land living niches. And by mammals, I don't mean today's mammals, but things that would later become mammals. But they were the dominant forms. And of course, one immediately thinks of the famous mammal-like reptiles. The big clade of pelicosaurs featuring everyone's favorite sail-backed reptile, Dimetrodon. But he also had a lot of other interesting relatives. For example... This was a big group, the pelicosaurs, so to call them, included not only dimetrodon, but things that looked like dimetrodon, but without a sail, and ophiacodon, the predatory axe-headed crawling big lizard thing, obviously comes to mind. And there were also a subgroup of these guys that were, once again, really silly looking, the cotylosaur, no, cotylorhynchids, the, they had, imagine a big lizard with the head the size of your fist and the body the size of a car and you get the idea and these were similar to the anapsids I discussed earlier and obviously they were among the silliest and gimbiest looking of all animals of all time but once again they were successful they were big eaters of plants and there wasn't any grass but whatever that was growing and other pelicosaurs evolved to become even more mammal like and I'm talking about things like uh, Sinognatus they had more stocky jaws and stronger bites and I don't know in certain cases probably even fur and warm blood and it's very funny one animal in this group Suminia was really noteworthy because it was a bit like a mammal like reptile trying to become a proto-lemur that lived 260 million years ago. It, it may have had adaptations for climbing. It had very long legs and a small, short head, big eyes. It, it was a really unusual animal. And once again, it shows you how diverse these mammal-like reptiles at this time and where their evolution would have led if this big extinction hadn't happened. And then finally, you know, there was a whole grab bag of reptiles. Among them were the ancestors of the earliest archosaurs. 
and the aptly named Arcosaurus, known from Russia and Poland, looked like a kind of stocky, no, slim, hyperactive crocodile with a big droopy nose. It was one of the minor species, I mean, it wasn't dominating any niche in particular. But watch this guy. After the extinction, their descendants would control the land, the sky, and, well, not the seas, but something quite like it, for more than a hundred million years. This is the guy whose descendants would be gone to become the dinosaurs, the crocodiles, the pterosaurs, the birds, all the lot. But not then. It was a minor actor of the Permian. And then in the seas, you had a bunch of strange animals too. I mean, this list is so long. I mean, you have the famous giant sea scorpions, the Eurypterids, growing sometimes as long as a door and with biting claws, you know. You have the famous trilobites swimming in the seas. Their diversity was decreasing, but they were still doing all right. And you had weird relatives of starship, no, not starships, starfish, named carpoids. And these were very unusual, bilaterally symmetric, means they had a left and right half rather than a star-like symmetry, relatives of starfish and sea urchins. So this was the cast of characters that populated this unusual land and the land was very unusual imagine now we have like what seven continents back then it was all one continent Pangaea a big chunk of land that occupied one third of the globe and the rest was a magnificent ocean named Pantalassa it's bigger than two Pacifics combined. Four thirds of the planet were blanketed by this ocean. And of course, we don't know this for sure now, but I'm sure there were islands, little islands like Hawaii or even New Zealand on this gigantic sea that no one ever knew about. And, I, and that would be my favorite place to go, actually. One of my favorite places to go. To explore the Pantalassan Ocean. Imagine the deep sea of such an ocean. Imagine those little hypothetical islands. Imagine that big continent, Pangaea. The interior was pretty arid. Almost like a titanic version of Australia. In all those deserts, there must be so many weird... Things like reptiles, insects, who knew? Endless fields of alien plants, arid interiors. And I'm sure there were these like gigantic salt lakes and big wadis and these enormous rocky valleys and hills that phew, you could take a lifetime trekking through that weird landscape populated by all those weird animals. I was just telling you about. But of course, the story came to an end as the Permian extinction crashed into the world. Now, I'm saying crashed because the likely explanation for this event was also some sort of cometary or asteroid strike, but on a much more massive scale. But at the same time, there were some other interesting things happening. It looks like a massive act of volcanism, a massive increase of carbon dioxide, a massive increase of methane gas, and some sort of extraterrestrial impact were all happening together at the same time. So people are still unclear about the main cause and as with many mass extinction it may be that there was more than one cause so let's not get too much into the detail of why this happened 
But let's talk about what would have happened if this event hadn't taken place. Now, as I told you before, towards the end of the Permian, the land was dominated by increasingly more mammal-like predators, herbivores, and also these reptile-like grazing animals. So if this event hadn't happened, there was no reason for things to have changed. Perhaps we would have even more and more mammal-like terapsids. And I was talking to you about Suminia before, the proto-lemur-like mammal-like reptile. And there could have been further evolution of these animals. So I predict that in a world without the Permian extinction, the Triassic period would have been populated by even more dog and cat-like versions of large predatory terapsids. Their prey would be these anapsid, armored, small-headed parareptiles together with plant-eating members of their own species. Actually, towards the end of the Permian and through the extinction, the most uh, common animal was something called a Lystrosaurus. That's L-Y-S-T-R-O-Saurus. And these were kind of like chunky, mammal-like reptile pigs almost. They had two tusks jutting out from their cheeks. They had beak-like uh, mouths, but also cheeks and grazing teeth to some degree. And there were a number of species of Lystrosaurus. Now, people assume that this was one type of animal, but no. There were big ones, small ones, medium ones, but they dominated terrestrial ecosystems. Almost like, hmm, almost like there were the livestock of some unknown intelligent species. <laughs> That's all speculation, of course, and we'll get there, but these animals were very common. So if the extinction hadn't happened, by the way, another interesting side note about Lystrosaurus was their big burrowing forelimbs. It seems that through the Permian extinction, you had to be a digger of some sort to survive. So I don't know what kind of awful cataclysm was racking the land, you know, maybe there were endless rains of ash. Even insects died, as I told you before. And some research suggests that there was a global superabundance of fungi at one point. Why? From all the decaying plants and animals. So imagine it's a world of corpses, like some sad black metal album. World of corpses! Permian extinction! Fungus. That, 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 that. Anyways, but let's assume that this awful event didn't happen. So, as I told you before, I'm predicting something like more and more advanced mammals ruling the land until you get to a point where, at the point where dinosaurs existed in our world you would have proto-mammals. Maybe some things like that reproduced like marsupials, but were not marsupials. You know, this is a counterfactual world. Before the split of mammals into proper marsupials or whatever. But it seems like you would have more and more active terapsids, more and more diverse forms. The lemur-like Suminia I told you just before could have evolved into even more lemur-like or even gliding and flying forms, you know. You could have protobats, proto-marsupial, pseudo-marsupial predators, big fat, pred big fat herbivores from both reptilian and reptomammal stock. Maybe something like, I don't know, 
imagine a big reptilian rhino being chased by these really wolf-like terapsids, while lemur-like, monkey-like, advanced climbing reptomammals cover on trees. And after that, it gets really difficult to predict because remember, we're still at the Triassic and we have more than almost more than 200 million years before we get to the present. Who knows, maybe the lemur reptomammals would evolve an intelligent species, but 200 million years ago or 100 million years ago. And if that happened, maybe it's another mass extinction, this time caused by an intelligent terapsid. But of course, life doesn't have a prerogative to evolve intelligent forms. You could just have animals forever. And maybe that's actually the better mode to exist for life. So who knows? Short answer to this long question. Probably an active world of mammaloids. And we would never have the rise of archosaurs. You know, no dinosaurs, no pterosaurs, no crocodiles. Well, I'm sure there would be some things like crocodiles. In fact, archosaurs could have remained limited to this kind of false crocodile niche while all the active animals came from this reptomammal stock that I was just talking about. And also you have to consider, imagine the Permian extinction didn't happen, but the late Cretaceous dinosaur extinction, well, not dinosaurs at this point, but the late Cretaceous extinction happened. Then what? Maybe the tables would turn then. And in the period after the dinosaurs on our earth, you would get the first active dinosaur-like animals. So it could be a completely topsy-turvy succession. But also, I mean, evolution gets really predict unpredictable when you think of these lengths of time and these little-known animals. You could probably have an entire new class of animals, you know, as new as birds are, but completely different. And what interests me about the Permian extinction is also the pleasant hobby of imagining alternative causes for this event. Now, remember the three unusual things I told you about this thing. The extinction affected insects, which doesn't regularly happen. In fact, it was the only one that killed off insects. And guess when it's being repeated? Today, motherfuckers. Yeah, it's, I mean, you could find this up that especially in industrialized countries, Germany, US, wherever, UK, the diversity of countryside insects is decreasing at an unprecedented rate. And heaven knows what's happening in the developing world. Maybe it's better, maybe it's worse. But in the first time since the Permian extinction, we're making a dent in insect diversity. Consider that other point that through the extinction, the only surviving animal was this Lystrosaurus species complex that made up all the animals in certain locations. Only these bunches of plant-eating pig-like things. Now, this is pure speculation. I have to give you an advanced warning. But maybe there was another intelligent species. Maybe we are seeing the results of their global warming, their pesticide use, their mass farming practices. I mean, the rational person in me knows that a civilization would leave more evidence behind, you know, a layer of processed metals or something. Or would they? I mean, maybe it was a Roman-grade civilization. 
But could a Roman great civilization create a global catastrophe without industry and fossil fuels and whatever? Were there fossil fuels in the Permian? That's another interesting thing. If you didn't have them, it's more difficult for a civilization to mess things up. But these are all good exercises to commit in your head. I wouldn't be surprised, you know. Certainly there was something completely different in the Permian extinction than the ones that followed it. The death toll was much more quicker and much higher. I mean, my gut feeling is this was probably global carbon dioxide methane meltdown triggered by massive volcanoes and a comet strike to act as a cherry on top. But now we are doing the same thing. That's the crux of the matter. It's not that there was an intelligent extinction in the Permian. But we are making, humans are making a Permian extinction today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. I mean, I think we're safe for another five generations, six. But then it's going to come down to it. It's going to be a massive turnover of carbon dioxide. And I'm not a climate change alarmist, by the way. I mean, I know the thing is real and it's going to have severe consequences. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. It's not going to be like Mad Max, but it's going to be like, I mean, you're going to have a long, happy life, but you're only going to have one or two kids. They will have a kind of 1920s Great Depression kind of life. Ah, Maybe for uh, two generations. Technology will help. But then, something's gonna push this shit into tipping point. It could be a huge volcano. You know, there are huge volcanoes laying dormant under the Yellowstone Park, for example. The Yellowstone Park in the States is a huge volcano. It's waiting to go off. If that happens, on top of what we're already doing, yeah, then it's gonna be pretty unpleasant. Eh? And I don't know, I think humanity could survive this, you know. I'm not, I'm not that much of a pessimist. We're adaptable. It's just going to be, I mean, let's how society is evolving now. We are placing more emphasis on security, for example. And we have a global civilization with extremely efficient networks. You know, anyone from the middle class can now get on a plane and be on the other side of the planet. These are good advantages. At the same time, you're seeing things like the U.S. building embassies that are indistinguishable from fortresses. Now, this is not to suggest any sort of American complicity or whatever, but anyone with the money, the foresight and the resources is investing in safety. The U.S. Embassy in London has moats. It just opened this week. Today is the 14th of December, 2017. It has moats like a medieval castle. So as things turn out, governments and extremely rich companies, at one point there's not going to be any distinction, are going to invest more in security. And it's going to become a sort of Retro medieval, you know, I mean, large numbers of people are going to perish or they may succumb to some sort of not lawlessness, but it's going to be imagine Lebanon in the 1980s, you know, or Afghanistan today. It's going to be like that. The population is going to decrease, not through massive death. Or, or events like that will happen, you know, big earthquakes, maybe wars and stuff. But it's going to be a more like long attrition. Uh, I mean, just bad health. You know, you're going to see things like uh, people dying before 30, 40 due to accidents, disease, whatever. 
But in the middle of this kind of Lebanon-like social landscape, you're going to have things like castles. These big companies and what's left of governments are going to have these isolated enclaves that are going to be a bit like the medieval world again. But it's going to be far more quiet. I mean, it's not going to be class system that directly, but the barriers are going to be so insurmountable that, uh, yeah, anyone can buy a house at the embassy castle, you know, but good luck on you if you expect to earn that money in your lifetime. So it's going to be something like that while the population decreases in the methods I just described. And then, you know, it's not going to be very dark, actually. I mean, life's going to go on. You know, it's People are rarely totally evil or totally good. And we're nothing if not resilient and adaptable. And one interesting thing about medieval ages is that in them they had a sort of humanity and a sort of seclusion from madness that was absent and sought after in the Roman period. I mean, there's a whole moral and philosophical side to this too. And yeah, I mean, majority of the population were bonkers, bullshit, religious, crazy. Or were they? I don't know. I mean, you look at some medieval monasteries, they are anything an intellectual person could ask for. Seclusion. Just work on the things you like. Farm the land. land. You know, go green, go eco, go sustainable. That sort of thing. So those fires are going to last throughout the winter of the world in the next five centuries. And technology, like some things are going to be forgotten, like some details of maybe internal combustion engines or engineering, they're going to be lost maybe forever. But fine things like nanotechnology, genetics are going to advance. And at the end, there will be a Permian extinction level. But people are going to survive. Maybe we'll farm insects, synthetic meat, whatever. And at the end, gradually, over a course of a few generations, many people are going to die. But as I told you, this is not going to be instantaneous, so it won't hurt as much. And then after, who knows? No. Maybe this cycle will repeat four or five times. I mean, in the very distant future, uh, the descendants of these monastery people could restock the land. Or the land could go native by itself. I mean, it's amazing how quickly ecosystems recover when people are taken out of the equation. So yeah, that's somewhat dark to contemplate. But, you know, that's the future. And that was the Permian extinction, and that was the world without the Permian extinction, and we got off into some really thought-provoking tangents from there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. It's good to be back. And please comment, like, and follow my videos. And have a happy 2018. It's going to be a, a nice year for all of us, I hope. Don't worry about the future too much. You're safe for another four generations, the least. And once again, take care and lots of love. Cheers.